Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another lecture for Analytic Geometry and Calculus 2. Now, in the past few lectures, we've been talking about finding the center of mass in one-dimensional and two-dimensional objects. Now, we saw that the complexity really scales once we move to two-dimensional objects, but there are cases where we can still solve these things. And what we particularly saw is that when you have a non-uniform density, so that's when your delta is a function of say x or of y, or maybe even both x and y, then the center of mass is not necessarily in the geographical center of your object, right? The most uh, familiar example for this would be the one-dimensional example where we put ourselves on a line and we had a density that increased as we went over that line. Now, if you have a uniform density, so a constant density, delta is just some constant value, then if you look back at the computations you take to find the center of mass, then the moment has a delta that factors out of it because it's constant, it comes out of the integral, and the mass of the object has a delta that comes out of it uh, because, again, it's constant, it comes out of the integral. Because we're dividing these things, we have a delta in the numerator, a delta in the denominator, and they cancel each other out. So density means nothing in this case. And that means that fundamentally, when you have a constant density or a uniform density for your object, then the question of finding the center of mass is fundamentally a geometry question. You're asking yourself, what is the geographic center of this object? And we've seen this before because we've been asked in the past maybe to find, say, the centroid of a triangle. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today, our centroids of objects. We can use uh, the knowledge that we've already built up for, say, triangles or simpler objects, and we can expand this to talk about any type of shape using these center of mass problems. And what I really want to focus on today is why centroids are important. And the reason that they're important, as we're going to see, are from two particular theorems going all the way back to the fourth century of an Alexandrian Greek uh, named Pappus, who came up with two theorems that are now named after him, the theorems of Pappus. And what these do, as we'll show in this lecture, they relate the centroid of an object to either the volume or the surface area of the object that's formed by taking that object and rotating it around some axis. So let's go ahead, let's jump right in and let me show you exactly what I'm talking about here. So the first theorem of Pappus that I want to talk about is Pappus's theorem for volumes. So let me write it out for you. So this is uh, Pappus's uh, theorem for volumes. And so what it says is that if a plane region, so uh, again, a two-dimensional object that we put in the xy plane, if this thing is revolved, around uh, a line in the plane uh, that does not cut through the region's interior. So, it's, it's, it's wordy, but this is everything that we've been doing so far, right? This is a, a volume or a solid of revolution is all this is. Uh, then the volume of the solid is, now I'm going to give you a formula and we will explain uh, what this formula is. So the volume is two pi rho a, where rho is the distance of the centroid 
So remember the center of mass when we have uniform density. So if you want to find the centroid of an object, you can just set delta equal to one and go through the usual center of mass calculations for this two-dimensional region. So rho is the distance of the centroid uh, to the axis of revolution. And A is the area of the surface. So there's something beautiful in the simplicity here, right? Because this is a very, very compact formula for all of these things that we've been working on uh, through many of the videos so far, right? This is the fundamental question that's been asked in a major portion of this work that we've been talking about. And now we boiled it all down to a simple equation. Remember, we had to use Riemann sums. We had to use the cylindrical shells. We had to use, um, you know, there, there were calculus-based methods that use definite integrals to get this. But Papyrus, uh, 16, 1700 years ago, something in that range, uh, figured out that there's a really simple uh, uh, answer to this. Now, of course, it's not as simple as it looks because finding the centroid is a fundamental uh, calculus problem, right? But nonetheless, you know, we have a nice way of, of relating the area uh, and the centroid of an object to the solid of revolution, and in particular, the volume of that solid of revolution. And, you know, just in case you wanted to, if you wanted to go through the proof of this thing, uh, this is really, you can just use the method of cylindrical shells. So you could, you know, set up a, a region in the plane and then, you know, everything would follow in a really sort of straightforward way. We're not gonna bother proving it because I really just wanna talk about how we can use this thing. It's much more fun to play with uh, than it is to really go through all the steps of proving it. So let me, uh, let me give you an example. Let's actually find some uh, volumes. So let's say find the volume of the torus. So this is a, a donut object. Um, generated by revolving a circular disk um, of radius A. So we're going to do this in complete generality. We're going to derive this formula about an axis. Uh, in its plane at a distance, we'll say B greater than or equal to A uh, from its center. Okay, so let's take a look at what it is exactly that I mean. I mean, I take a, a circle, not so perfect, but close enough. This thing has a center and the radius of this circle is given by A. And let's imagine that it's being revolved around some axis so that this distance, uh, maybe let's use, uh, let's use this pink. This distance right here is equal to B. And the, the resulting object will be basically a perfect donut, right? You take that, that circle out of the board and let it trace out a nice um, donut shape. I mean, that's, that's the best description we could possibly make here. So now the question is, you know, how do we apply the theorem of papyrus? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's a fairly easy thing to do because the area is just given by pi times the radius squared, All right? So the area is equal to pi times the radius squared, which in our case, the radius is equal to a, so we get pi a squared. Now, rho in this case is given to us explicitly, right? This is given to us as B. This is the distance from the center of the circle to the axis of rotation. And 
you know, in three lines and a, a very poorly drawn picture, we've got our solution. Two pi times rho, which is equal to B, times capital A, the area, which is pi A squared, which is equal to two pi squared B A squared. So now you can find, you can use this formula. This is a formula that you could have looked up before this as well. Uh, and it will tell you the area of a torus as long as you know the distance from the middle of that torus. So that's the, the center of each circle if you're gonna slice that donut and the radius of the circle used to form that thing. And of course, you know, if you wanted to, you could do this the old fashioned way and you could use the method of cylindrical shells, for example, uh, and it would be a huge pain, right? It'd be a lot of, lot of work. But now what we can see is that, uh, you know, we have a nice uh, compact way of doing this. And actually uh, we can use Papyrus's formula to go backwards as well. So we can use volumes that we know. So for example, volumes that we might've even calculated in some of the previous lectures and use them to find the centroids. So that eliminates the really complicated stuff that we've been working on in the past few video lectures where we talk about you know, finding the center of mass. So let me give an example. Let's say find the centroid Uh, of a semicircular region of radius A. Okay, so we, we can offer up a little sketch here. Let's draw the XY plane. X, Y. Uh, it's not going to be pretty, but it exists. This is positive A. This is minus, sorry, minus A, not minus two. Minus A. And the curve here is given by square root of A squared minus X squared. So the question is, how do we turn this into, uh, or, or what do we revolve this thing around to get a, an object that we know the volume of right off the bat for which we can find the centroid of this thing? Well, the first thing that I'm going to tell you is this is a lot like the example we did with the, the two-dimensional center of mass problem. This thing is symmetric uh, from X to minus X, right? I can flip it like this and it's exactly the same object. So because this thing is, um, uh, it has uniform density. So Delta is equal to a constant. You can always just assume it's equal to one in this case. Your calculations are gonna show you that X bar is equal to zero. So the question is now, how do we calculate Y bar? Well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take that semicircular region and let's revolve it around the x-axis. So let's do this. Revolve around x-axis. So that is the curve y equal to zero. Okay, and what we've shown so far is that the centroid has to lie somewhere on this line right here. So we're just looking for the y bar value. But that means that if you're revolving around this axis, the centroid is just given, or sorry, the, the row value, the distance from y equal to zero up is just given by your y value, y bar value. So note, rho is equal to y bar. So now the question is, what was the um, object that we actually created here? Well, we created a sphere. Right, we took this half circle and rotated around the y axis, or sorry, the, the x axis. We got a perfect sphere. And I know the volume of this thing. The volume is equal to four over three pi. Now the radius cubed, the radius is again equal to a, just like the last example. And I know the area of my uh, semicircle here that's being rotated, this thing is just given by 
uh, one half, so half of the circle with radius a, which is one half pi a squared. So I know that volume from uh, Papyrus or uh, Pappus's theorem tells us that volume is equal to two pi rho a, which I can rearrange to get y bar, which is equal to rho, is equal to volume over two pi a, which is equal to four over three pi a cubed divided by two pi one half pi a squared. There's a lot of canceling here. So let's just uh, knock a few things off. The two and the one half, they're gonna cancel with each other. This pi and this pi are gonna cancel with each other. This squared is going to take off that exponent of three, leave us with one. And life is pretty good. We got four a over three pi. So, you know, somewhere up here, just a little bit. This might be four a over three pi. So that's the centroid, right? So this is beautiful. This gives us not only a, a quick method of finding volumes, but it also gives us a quick method of finding centroids, right? And then I think that you probably appreciate that a little bit more than the volume calculation based on how frustrating and complicated the previous video lectures have probably been. Okay, so I promised uh, two theorems by Pappus. So let me give you the second one. So this theorem, this is actually uh, Pappus's theorem for surface areas. So another problem that we've been working on. And basically this says, if an arc, so remember if you go all the way back to how we actually uh, created a surface of revolution. We took a one dimensional curve and rotated that thing. And then we, we were looking to find the surface area of that. So if an arc of a smooth uh, plane curve, so something in the X, Y plane, we just want it to be two dimensional or sitting in it flat, maybe if you want to think of it that way, is revolved once, uh, about a line uh, in the plane. So again, it's, it's quite wordy, but if it's revolved once uh, about a line in the plane that does not uh, cut through the arc's interior, Uh, then the surface area of the resulting surface is given by, we'll call this S, and this is 2 pi rho L, where Again, rho is the same as above. So rho is the distance, rho equals distance uh, from the axis of revolution to the centroid. To the centroid and L equals to the length of the curve. So it's basically just the one dimensional version of the, the same uh, formula that I gave you in the previous page or uh, the previous theorem, right? Uh, all that I'm doing here is or replacing area, which is fundamentally a two dimensional thing with length, which is a one dimensional thing. So there's really not a like, to, to memorize these two theorems, there's not a whole lot, right? You just swap off uh, the two-dimensional version area for the one-dimensional version length. And again, you can prove this uh, using Riemann sums again, uh, but we're gonna skip the proof and 
let's give a let's let's do an example. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to find the surface area. of the torus from the first example. So remember what that was? It was a, uh, uh, sorry, it was a, a circle of radius A that is revolved around some uh, axis that is a distance B from the centroid or from the center of the circle, which is in this case, the centroid as well. So last time we just calculated the volume. So now let's use Papyrus's theorem to calculate uh, the, the actual, the surface area of this thing. So Papyrus tells us that we've got two pi rho L. Now rho never changed in both examples. Rho is still going to be B, right? It's the distance from the axis of revolution to the center of the circle. So let's fill that in. Now, the thing that did change is the uh, length L. So maybe we should have a think about that, right? What is actually the length? Well, the curve that's being re uh, revolved is that perfect circle. And so therefore the length of that curve is the circumference of that circle. So we remember the circumference is pi times the diameter. The diameter is twice the radius. So we get two pi times the radius, which in our case is equal to A. And so now we get a really, really nice compact formula again, giving us four pi squared B times A. And if you want to make your life complicated, but if you also want to do a little bit of practice, try actually doing this with uh, the methods, the previous methods of using these, um, these methods for calculating surface areas using definite integrals. Of course, it's going to be a much more difficult and involved problem. Uh, and now these theorems of Pappus just really boil things down for us. So that's all that I want to say about uh, these theorems of Pappus. I, I really want to emphasize how nice they are. And we've seen some really great examples here because we've seen, you know, not only can you do the sort of straight computation problems of finding the volume or finding the surface area, but we saw how you can turn this problem on its head and make things simpler for your life because you can use them to find the centroid, for example. And that is a much better thing than having to use those complicated definite integrals, which involve say the moments and the mass, especially in two dimensions where we saw that things get very complicated very quickly. Okay, see you for the next video.